Obviously, it's an adaptation of the HP, famous HP Lovecraft short story about a meteor that kind of crashes onto an American farm, and it starts to uh, sort of like uh, biologically and psychologically mutate everything that it kind of touches. And the thing that was so interesting about Lovecraft's story was that he designed it to be a kind of... Um, counterpoint to what sci-fi looked like at that time yeah yeah you were mentioning it was more like aliens come down and they basically do all the things that human beings have done in the history right like like they are designed with um a body that's sort of similar to ours right. they, they organize their society us. so similar to ours they come yeah. down in a ship that we can imagine and they're like we're going to enslave you to uh you know increase our economy and all of this <laughs> right. and and like hp lovecraft was kind of like if aliens, if there is an extraterrestrial life, I don't know that it's going to communicate with us in ways that we would actually comprehend. It would make sense to us. Yeah. So this it's like, why would the, why would we assume it would just make all the same structures that we've made? All exactly. The same so, so he conceived of an alien species and an alien organism that we would look at and be like, what the fuck is that? I yeah, don't understand. And, and it's totally so much scarier because we will have no fucking idea. It's unknowable. It's cosmic. And... It's, it's almost like intangible and we wouldn't be able to comprehend. So it thought yep. of aliens in terms of less human physicality and more in terms of like, um, you know, w- what is the wildest shit that we couldn't even perceive? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and Richard Stanley tackles that story for the most part pretty faithfully. The tone is a little sillier than you would expect of H.P. Yeah. And, and I think some people are a little disappointed because the H.P. Lovecraft story is serious and most adaptations that exist of H.P. Lovecraft, like uh, Reanimator yeah. and From Beyond, no, they're funny. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, and, those and aren't... <laughs> so so mo- most people who have adapted H.P. Lovecraft have not really known what to do beyond trying to pivot into a bit of like a camp quality. So I think I think some people expected because Richard Stanley's Dust Devil from 1990 and uh, his other one um, uh, Hardware he did uh, Hardware as well both of them were more kind of like serious horror oh. I think people were expecting more of a serious horror and and I mean to be fair I think when he originally signed on to the movie he kind of thought he might be doing something more like Tarkovsky esque Do you think Cage had anything to do I with it I think bringing on Cage kind of shifted what he wanted to do with the film a little bit but because he seems aware of Cage's I think that what he does with the film is still interesting. I and, do too. And, and for me, the fact that the performances are kind of strange and they just get stranger as the film goes on, yeah. it adds to that disorienting quality of what the fuck is going on. Yeah. Um, and I, I found a lot of people were kind of complaining about, well, one, with Cage, it seems like people either love him or hate him kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like they either can't take him seriously and I, I mean, I can kind of get that. But the thing is, with this movie, what I think he's doing is he's kind of capturing this, uh, like, 50s sitcom dad at first mm-hmm. that is a little bit weird and, and a little exaggerated. It, it's not as good, but it, do, it reminds me of the complaints people have about Jack Nicholson's performance in The Shining. Where, yeah. where, where it's like, he's crazy before the hotel actually starts making him crazy. Right. And, and Nick Cage kind of has a similar performance here where he's doing his cage thing. Yeah. And then the cage thing just gets accentuated as the color starts to exactly. sort of in, in, infect him. And I'll and say that, yes, he is doing... Good job, str- Nathan. Yeah. <laughs> why, do you have to, why do you have to try to be an artist, Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about his dad. What, one of my favorite lines. I've had it with your drama, Lavernia. <laughs> yeah. Well, better yet, why don't I get the fuck out of yours? <laughs> like, there's some absolutely insane line deliveries in this. Yeah. One of my favorites, me and Shane, it's because it reminds me, and if my, and if my dad listens to this, we love you. Uh, this this part reminded me of my dad when he, like, kind of has a freak out moment or whatever. <laughs> and it's the part where he's he goes into the farm and he's with the with all the the llamas, and he's just the like alpacas. W- sorry, yes, the Very alpacas. Very important distinction. There is a amazing alpacas piece of dialogue. are a beautiful animal. Yes, <laughs> and there and then it, that also comes with an amazing piece of dialogue yes. that the daughter says so well. That actress nails it in yeah. this movie. Um, but he goes into the the alpaca farmhouse, and um, and he and he just goes something like, he's like, it'd be great <coughs> if I could just get. A little bit of fucking appreciation around here, <laughs> and like it's such a, it's such a, you know those moments where you're like, kind of whisper, yeah, 
screaming yeah. where you're like, let's say someone's in the other room and you're just kind of frustrated. Yeah. So you're like, that goddamn mother, like that yeah. whole thing. It gives me that vibe. And since it's Nick Cage doing it, he, he gives me this jaded father mm-hmm. thing this whole time. Yeah. And I, I just love it. I think it's very funny. It's and dad it's Cage. Just, yeah, it's Dad Cage. And uh, there's even, there's a line where he goes like, honey, would you get us some wine? And then he, he like snaps his fingers and does a point. And he goes, I know just the thing. Yeah. And I don't know, it gives me this very <coughs> 50s kind of sitcom dad vibe. And right. then as the movie goes, he just gets more unhinged, more modern cage like. Yeah, he starts, and, he starts uh, screaming. Uh, yeah. and he even be- brings back his vampire's kiss accent, which is yep. unreal. Yep. Like, it, it's just unreal to see it there, or hear it. There's, there's a, pa- uh, Again. a point where he's just slam, dump- slam dunking vegetation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, because it's all just trash or whatever. Yeah, because because the color mutated his garden and it grew everything big and juicy, but it tastes like garbage. He's like, why does it taste like garbage? He's like, <laughs> right. And he, and this is where it starts to take the turns. And I think this is where people get a little bit like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. See, this is this is scene, this is where it kicks into the gear that I like the most. For yeah. me, it t- it takes a little bit of time to get there, but as soon as that switch happens, where things start to get into the realm of like confusion and psychedelic and things of that nature. I think that's where Richard Stanley actually takes the horror more seriously. Yeah. And like some of those psychedelic elements and the body horror elements that come out of that, like the alpaca creature that exists in the film, which is a direct reference to the thing. And I know this right. because I actually interviewed Richard Stanley yeah, uh, yeah. and he straight up told me that that was a reference to uh, the thing. Um, and then, you know, you get into the body horror of that and the fucking exploding heads and just fucking, yeah. yeah. And then you have the elements, like even at the beginning.